I'm Bobby Rinkle and I welcome you to Evening Upstairs at York Library. Tonight's program will discuss the history of flatboat travels on the Ohio River, as well as a discovery in 2000 of an early 1800s flatboat wreck along the Ohio River shoreline in southern Illinois. This wreck represents the only example of a flatboat ever discovered. Our speaker is director of the Center for Archaeological Investigations in Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. He's former president of Illinois Archaeological Survey and author of The Road Site, A Historic Kickapoo Village on the Indian Illinois <laughs> Prairie, as well as numerous essays, technical reports, and books. Let's welcome our guest tonight, Dr. Mark Wagner, as he discusses arcs, rod horns, and hoop pole boats, the America Flatboat Wreck in Southern Illinois. Thank you. Well, how are you? I uh, hope you can all hear me. I haven't ever worn one of these before. Uh, before I start, this is John Schwagman here in the front, and he is the person who discovered the boat I'm going to talk about tonight. So just as an introduction, John was the one who found it. Uh, Flatboats, uh, a lot of people know about them, but they really don't know their history. And they were one of the most common boats on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. And uh, they first appeared on the Ohio and the Mississippi about the 1780s. This is one of the oldest boat building traditions in the world though. This was imported from England. People were building flat bottomed boats as long as about 3,000 years ago. And by the 1600s they were building flat bottomed boats uh, in the colonies uh, in places like Virginia. But these things really didn't take off until the 1770s and 1780s when the settlers crossed over the mountains and they entered into the upper Ohio Valley around Pittsburgh and areas like that. And then these things just took off overnight and they became the most prevalent boat on the uh, Ohio and Mississippi. And pr this, the flatboat era lasted from around 1780 to about 1900. It, they lasted a lot longer than anybody ever thought they did. Uh, they weren't, uh, keel boats uh, disappeared with the invention of the steamboat. But these boats kept on being built all through the steamboat era. Even, at, even as late as the 1850s, 1860s, uh, there are records of 5,000 of them docking in a single year at Cincinnati, Ohio. And probably in the whole era, from the 1780s to 1900, there were probably several hundred thousand of these boats were built. But the thing about them is they're one-way boats, and they float with the current. Uh, and so they're designed to go downriver, but not come up. And the boat also is part of the cargo. So when you get to wherever you're going, the boat is broken up for its timber, and the people walk back home, or they ride back home. Later on, uh, in the steamboat era, they would take steamboats back river, up river, or they would even take railroads back up river. So the consequence is, uh, not a single one of these survives in a museum anywhere in the United States. And the reason is they were, they were disposable boats and they're made to be broken up when they get to their destination. And so unless one wrecks, uh, you'll never find one. You don't know anything about them. And that's what's important about the boat that John found. It's the only example of one of these boats ever found anywhere in the United States, in the Ohio Mississippi River Valley. So out of hundreds of thousands of these boats that were built, only one has ever been found. Now there are probably other ones out there uh, but they just haven't been recognized. So this, is, this boat gives us information that we don't get from anywhere else. And this is a, a scene that was done by an artist about 20 years ago. And it's pretty, pretty accurate, depicts a flat boat passing by. If you're familiar with the Mississippi, that's Tower Rock, uh, over around uh, Jackson County, Illinois, in that area like that. Very famous landmark, National Historic Landmark. But this is pretty typical, showing you what a flat boat would have looked like. Uh, often had these upper cabins on them. This isn't very accurate with this guy holding this paddle on the side is not too accurate, but the guy in the back is holding a, a steering oar, which is the way that you would navigate these down the road, I mean down the river. And they also had these big sweeps on the side that they would use to try and, and steer the boat. They didn't power the boat with those things. The boats only floated with the river current. Uh, and this is kind of what I've been talking about. They're, they look like floating shoeboxes. 
and they first appeared in the Ohio in the late 1700s. Hundreds of thousands of these were built. Uh, they're built by local settlers, and they're also built in commercial shipyards. Uh, and again, the flatboat era ended around 1900 when they started constructing locks and dams in the Ohio and the Mississippi River. And they were never outcompeted by steamboats because even, even in the steamboat era, if you were a local farmer, it was cheaper to build one of these things and just float down the river than it might be to get your produce down the river on a, uh, on a steamboat. So these things survived up until around 1900. And I've got some photos of some of the last ones that survived. Uh, this is a model that's in the SIU Museum, and it was built in, by WPA artists in the 1930s. It actually is really accurate, and it's so accurate that it may have been built, if you figure in the 1930s, this could have been built by somebody who actually saw a flatboat. And uh, the characteristics of a flatboat are, they, I mean, they're very similar to modern barges. They have flat bottoms, they have angled fronts like a modern barge, they have wood plank sides, sometimes they have cabins, and then they have these oars on the side for steering. Uh, who built them? Uh, like I said, a lot of them were built by local settlers. Uh, these things were built in all, virtually every creek along the Ohio and the Mississippi River. Uh, if you're a local settler in the early 1800s, there are no roads. The few roads that are there are not very good. Uh, the only market that they have for their produce is the Ohio and Mississippi River. So you've got to, whatever you produce, uh, corn, uh, pork, tobacco, uh, in some cases, in slave states, slaves, uh, all sorts of produce that's carried down the river on these boats. And they're heading down to uh, the lower Mississippi, to Natchez, places like New Orleans. Uh, by the mid-1800s, these boats start getting bigger and bigger in size. And they start getting built in commercial shipyards by the mid-1800s. But this is, you know, a pretty famous account. Abraham Lincoln himself built or worked on at least two different flatboats that went all the way down to New Orleans. And this is actually, I used to have a clip from this movie, uh, Abraham Lincoln. There's actually a movie about Abraham Lincoln's voyage, a silent movie, uh, that was made in the early 1900s, showing Lincoln going down the Ohio River. Or, well, actually, probably would have been the Mississippi River. And uh, this boat is actually pretty accurate. And it may actually be a real flat boat that survived in the early 1900s. The only bad thing about it is this steering oar in the back, or this, yeah, the big steering oar in the back, which is just laying in between two sticks. It's got nothing to hold it in place. So that's not very accurate, but the rest of it is pretty accurate. Uh, how do you build one of these boats? Well, every local settler in every Creek Valley probably knew how to build one of these things. They're using the same technology that they use to build log cabins. So they're very simple boats. Uh, I could not build a sailing ship or any sort of a boat that's got a keel on the bottom or got curved sides to it, but I could build one of these things. All they are are very simple boxes and they're building them with the same tools that they use to build log cabins. So every, you know, virtually everybody knows how to build one of these things. Uh, they start out, they get a big tree and they split two long boards out of it for the sides of the boat. but. What they do is they start building it, when they build it, they start building it upside down. And this is part of uh, building fl flat bottom boats all over the world. Uh, and they do that because they want to put a bottom on that's flush to the, to the boat. So when they, they build it upside down first and then they'll put on the plank floor to it and these things are held together with wooden pegs. Uh, once you get it like that, you have to drag it down into the river to, uh, to get it flipped the right way up. And what they would do is they'd hook oxen to them. Maybe they'd hook up some sort of a rope over a tree limb. They'd drag these things down into the river, upside down. And so the, the hull would be floating upside down in the river. And they might build, uh, you know, like a, a plank side on one side. They'd pull a lot of rock, rocks on one side of the boat. Eventually, it would be way so much, it would flip the boat upside down. I mean, right side up. And then they would tow it back up to the rip, back up to the shore, and they'd start on the superstructure like that. And this is showing that sort of thing going on here, where initially they started out with a boat upside down, flipped it over in the river, hauled it back up on shore, and then they started putting up the upper part of the boat. 
These are sort of tools that you need to put one of those together, and they're very simple tools. Uh, you need a caulking mallet and a chisel, and these sort of things are standard uh, tools that you have to carry on a flat boat. Uh, the reason is you have to caulk the seams to make the boat uh, watertight, and they use something they call strandum oakum. They would take ropes apart, like they're showing up here, and they'd twist it and they'd make a fiber, and then you would drive the fiber in between the seams, and then you would take uh, tar or melted pitch and you use that to seal the boats, the seams. The, but uh, all the books regarding flatboat travel advise people to carry caulking irons and mallets with them on the flatboat because the problem is if you got stuck or you got stranded or you ran it up on a sandbar, uh, it would dry out and the steam seams would start to split open again. So you would have to recaulk the thing. And if you didn't have a caulking mallet and an iron, with you, uh, you know, you, you're, you would be stranded there forever, wherever you ended up. These are all examples of flat boats. Uh, there is no right way to build a flat boat. These things are all, or at least the ones that are being by, built by settlers are being built in local building traditions. And it's like a grandfather teaches a father, teaches his son how to build these things. So there's probably a different building tradition going on in every different creek. So there's really not a right way to build one of these things. Uh, of these, this is probably, the, uh, this is one is done from life, and it shows one with high plank sides. They've got the steering oar off the back. They've got so guys on the sides who are working the sweeps, and those aren't the power of the boat, but they're there to help steer the boat, just like this big oar in the back, because again, they're floating with the current. But then we have accounts of boats like this, uh, that are real simple. Uh, all they've got on them maybe is a little tent or a cabin. They don't have that big cabin like this one is built. And this one, the cargo is down inside of it. And these are some other examples. Uh, this one is not too accurate, but you see it reproduced everywhere. But it just kind of gives you an idea of the sorts of things that people would care, carry on these boats. That settlers would carry their livestock with them. So if you're moving down from like going down the Ohio River, you might carry your horses with you, you might carry your cows with you, you might carry your pigs with you, things like that. Uh, this is a lithograph done in the 1850s. Uh, this is a, a real famous uh, painting by George Caleb Bingham. And they, they re reproduced it like crazy on all these lithographs they'd make. But again, it shows you a pretty good idea of what a flat boat looks like. This thing sits pretty deep in the water. It's got high sides, it's got a cabin down there. It's also, you can get into the cabin through the top up like that. And again, they've got those big sweeps on the side. And sometimes these boats would have, they'd have anywhere from uh, maybe three sweeps. If you, had a lot, if you had a small boat, you might only have the one in the back like this one. And two on the side. You get a bigger boat like this one. It's got five because it'll have another pair on the other side. And sometimes they even have a big sweep in the front. So they might have as many as six sweeps on a really big boat. And this is a photo that's of one that, uh, this is actually a Mississippi River flat boat. This uh, came out of a museum in Iowa. This is post-Civil War era. And it gives you a pretty good example of what one, an actual photograph of what one of these things looks like, look like. In this case, they've got it completely roofed over. Cabin completely covers it. They've got a huge sweep off the back of the boat like that. Uh, they've got some of their cargo even up on top. This looks like another sweep that's coming off down there on the side. So where are they going? Well, this is uh, the route they would follow. Uh, in the fall, uh, these boats would start down both the Ohio and the Mississippi. And like I said, there are accounts like of, of places like Cairo of 5,000 boats passing Cairo in a season. And uh, if you were the first people on the river in the fall, like these guys here, and you've got, actually got rafts going down the river, but if you were the first uh, crew on the river, you might sell out real quickly. You might make it down to like Tennessee or the upper Mississippi. There are a lot of plantations down here that need produce. And this might be the end of your voyage. You make it that far down and you're done. Uh, and the later you go in the season, uh, the more and more crowded it gets, the more and more the markets are already glutted. And so if you're starting off late, you may go all the way down to New Orleans. 
and you may find nobody that wants to buy what you have for sale. And so sometimes these guys would make the trip all the way to New Orleans, and they, they would literally have to give their cargoes away. Nobody would buy it because they, the market was so glutted. Uh, but going down the river, there were books that you could buy. You got to figure that a lot of these guys, Abraham Lincoln was an example, uh, the first time he was on a flatboat, he'd never been down river. Uh, so you get guys, you get crews, where you might have the crew essentially might even be teenagers. And they'd never been on the river before. So this takes a lot of nerve to build one of these things. Uh, I don't think people would do it today. And you know, you, all you know is that New Orleans is down river somewhere. And they get on these boats and they start down the river. And you could buy guidebooks like this. This was made by a, man, a very famous book called by, by a man named Zadok Kramer. And he operated out of Pittsburgh. And he actually made one or two voyages by himself down the river. But after that, he worked out of Pittsburgh. Every year, he'd publish a new edition of this thing. He would interview people who had come back up the river. And they would tell him, well, there's a new sandbar formed here. The bank is caved in here, and things like that. So he would update it. And so this is his map of the lower Ohio uh, coming through this area. And he's actually got river miles figured from Pittsburgh and shows you where all the sandbars are, things like that. Uh, sailing flatboats was incredibly dangerous. These things wrecked like crazy. And uh, you got to figure, for one thing, they're inexperienced crews. Uh, but there are accounts of these things wrecking in storms, hitting rocks and snags in the rivers going down, uh, getting, being crushed in the ice. Uh, grounded on sandbars, uh, destroyed by collapsing riverbanks, being destroyed in tornadoes. And some of the accounts that you read, uh, diaries from that period, uh, literally it'll be like the guy will say something like, I passed a wrecked flatboat, passed another wrecked flatboat, passed five wrecked flatboats. You know, came to a point, saw ten wrecked flatboats. So these things are wrecking like crazy going down the river. The river is very dangerous. There's, an, there's one account by... Uh, Timothy Flint, he's talking about being in the 1820s on a storm on the Mississippi River where uh, he's traveling with, uh, I think they're traveling like with about 20 boats and two of them get caught up. In the, the Mississippi is flooded from uh, one bank all the way on both sides of the river, probably a couple miles wide. And uh, he sees a boat coming by him and it's in the process of sinking and uh, they manage to get in, get the other, get everybody off. They see the other boat get, go down. They can't save anybody from it. So boats are, you know, this is a, a thing that happens. And, and entire crews are lost. And if you're a, a person who's sailing on one of these things and you disappear, your family is not going to know for months what happened to you. But this is actually, this is right here. This is at Fort Massac in 1828. And there is a raft in the foreground. And there is a wrecked flatboat sitting behind it. And you can see the big steering oar coming off the back of it. So wherever this boat was coming from, it made it to Fort Massac before it wrecked. Uh, the other thing, if you read Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi, uh, in the steamboat era, these flatboats were run down by steamboats. And by law, uh, steamboat crews had to do this. I mean, a flatboat crews had to do this. They had to have a lantern on at night to warn steamboats of where they were. Well, a lot of times they ran dark in the night. Uh, they wouldn't do this. Uh, Mark Twain said the reason is because they'd be doing what these guys are doing. They're all down below decks, and they're all drinking and gambling, and they're running dark in the night. And, you know, a steamboat he was on, they ran down one of these flatboats. And uh, this is kind of an example of what you're seeing up here. This is actually by Cave in Rock, where you've got a steamboat and a flatboat very close to each other. So they'd go down from collisions with steamboats also. Uh, Indian attacks. Again, this is down by Fort Massac. Uh, it, it was much more common in the upper Ohio River to have Indian attacks. This is near the end of what they called uh, the 20 Years' War for the Old Northwest. Uh, starting at the American Revolution, uh, Indians were determined to stop American settlement in the Ohio Valley, and so for 20 years, there is fighting going on in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky with the Indians trying to stop the settlement. And one of the things they would do 
was attack uh, flatboats. And this is an example of it. This is by a modern artist. It's called, uh, I think, uh, something, I think the title of this is something like, What Else Could Possibly Go Wrong? And what you've got are settlers who are stranded on flatboats out here, and they're trying to get their flatboats off the sandbar. But I think he, the, the artist means it in two ways. It, with the title, it's like, What Else Could Possibly Go Wrong? From the Indian's point of view, this is not a good thing either because they're saying flatboat travelers on the river, which is not what they want. Uh, there are a lot of stories about river pirates on, on the Ohio and the Mississippi. And they, there were, in fact, uh, real pirates. Uh, a lot of the stories are exaggerated. There was a literary tradition in the early 1800s, in the 1830s. They liked to write, uh, they were writing things like the Davy Crockett stories and the Mike Fink stories. And they also liked to write pirate stories. They liked to write about, the one fictional pirate was called Colonel Plug, and they liked to make these up. But there were real pirates. Uh, again, if you're going down the Mississippi or the Ohio River, your family does not expect to see you for a couple months. Uh, so if <laughs> some people, if pirates manage to get on a boat and, and uh, capture it, uh, you know, they can take the contents of those looted flatboats and then go down river to somewhere like Natchez and sell that cargo. Uh, on the way back, uh, there's also accounts of people walking back home from New Orleans on the Natchez Trace and they're being attacked by pirates and robbers because they know they've got money. So that sort of thing it can happen. This is a, 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 a little uh, drawing from about the mid-1800s showing something like that of a, a traveler being murdered on the Natchez Trace. Uh, there are a lot of stories about cave-in rock here, and a lot of those stories, again, are exaggerated. Uh, and the reason for that is cave-in rock is such a prominent place. Uh, everybody stops at cave-in rock, and when you read all these accounts of flatboat trailers, every single one stopped there. So you've got thousands of boats coming down the river, and it's such a prominent place that everybody stops there. So if you're an outlaw operating out of it, it's not the sort of place you really want to operate out of. Because if somebody reports they've been robbed and they say, I've been robbed at Cave and Rock, they know exactly where to go to get you. They know where you are at. But there was one real pirate who set up at Cave and Rock, and he's the source of all the stories. And that's Captain Samuel Mason. And he set up at Cave and Rock in 1797. And this is him, if you remember how the West was won, this is Walter Brennan playing Samuel Mason, although he was called Jeb Hawkins in the movie. And Samuel Mason was a captain in the Revolutionary War. Uh, he fought in the, uh, he wasn't in, didn't fight in the East, he fought in the West in areas like Pennsylvania, fought against Indians. Uh, he developed a really bad reputation uh, uh, after the war. He ran a tavern up in the upper Ohio. He made things uncomfortable for himself. Uh, he essentially was chased out of the upper Ohio River Valley. Came down, he moved into Tennessee over by Knoxville. Uh, he and his family and his followers, where they promptly started robbing slave cabins. They were stealing things from slaves. And Colonel John Sevier ordered them out of East Tennessee and so they fled to the lower Ohio, and they set up at uh, Red Banks, which is now Henderson, uh, Kentucky. And they operated out of there for a number of years. And it's kind of like an Old West movie. Uh, he and his gang, would, they wouldn't do violence in town, but they would stop boats below town somewhere miles downriver, and they would, they'd rob the boats. And there are, we have accounts from court testimony about them robbing and killing people. And the constable in uh, uh, Henderson wouldn't do anything about it because he said, my jurisdiction, what happens on the river, does not concern me. And so Mason was able to get away with this for a long time. And in 1795, uh, he and his gang uh, murdered the constable from ambush. And it, you know, it, it did just like in a Western movie. They raised a posse and they chased him and his family out of Kentucky. Uh, they fled into the lower Ohio River Valley, and uh, the same year that they were chased out was 1797, was when they set up at Cave and Rock, and I think they were only there for a couple of months uh, because people were still actively looking for them 
And if it had been known that they were at Cave in Rock, um, the sheriff would have known, and the posse would have known where to find them. And the posse actually did run down some of the gang members and kill them. Uh, but this is, this is actually uh, Walter Brennan playing him in, in 1962. And uh, all I can say is Walter Brennan must have channeled his ghost. Because if you remember the movie, he's got him exactly right. He's exactly the right age. He's got his personality right. And we actually know what sort of clothes Mason wore because when he was captured, they inventoried all his gang's possessions, including the clothes they were wearing. And this is what Mason dressed like, wearing this sort of waistcoat like Walter Brennan's got on. So, I mean, it's kind of a, you know, uh, a, if you want to know what Samuel Mason was really like, watch that movie. Uh, if you survived, well, wait a second, I'll go back to that for a second and talk a little bit more about Samuel Mason. What happened is he operated out of Cave and Rock from 1797, and then he was in the lower Ohio to about 1800. And by this time, uh, there's more and more traffic in the lower Ohio River Valley. The army is moving in to the lower Ohio River Valley. There's a whole series of posts, uh, one really big one right across the river uh, at Contoma Wilkinson that had over 1,000 soldiers. So there are military boats going up and down the river all the time, and Mason uh, essentially uh, leaves the Ohio River Valley and he moves down into uh, what's now northeast Arkansas. And uh, he moved in there and uh, oh, it was called the, I think it was called the Prairie Settlement. And uh, he and his family went there and they promptly, oh well, they had, first they had to get admitted. That was all Spanish territory. And uh, Mason and his sons actually had to go down to New Madrid and get passports to enter into Spanish territory. And people showed up at the hearing and saying, he's a pirate, you don't want to let him in to Spanish territory. And Mason just would play this innocent old farmer and he'd say, I don't know why they say these bad things about me. All I want to do is live in peace with my family and raise crops. And the Spanish let him in. And they promptly went to robbing boats on the Mississippi again. And uh, what happened is they made the mistake in 1803 they robbed the same boat twice. And uh, they made the guy so angry, and he was fairly prominent, that he, uh, you know, he, he went to the Spanish authorities and said, I've been robbed by Samuel Mason on the river. And so it caused a big uproar. Uh, the Spanish raised the militia, which essentially were French, even though they, uh, you know, it had hit, hit always been French. It was only nominally Spanish territory. But the militia went, and they found him at this settlement where he and his family had moved into. And the reason they found him was that a lot of the settlers in that, uh, that town or that settlement were from Kentucky, and they knew all about him. And they said, this is Samuel Mason. He's, he's in our town. And uh, so the Spanish surrounded it. Uh, they captured him and his family and about half of his gang. They brought them all up to uh, New Madrid, and they had a three-day inquest as to find out if he was really a pirate or not. And that's how we know so much about him. If it wasn't for that inquest, we, he would be, you might think he was a fictional character. But that testimony still survives. It's the manuscript, the actual testimony is in the Mississippi Department of Archives. And uh, what happened at the inquest was he and one of his gang turned on each other, John Sutton. And Mason tried to pin out all the crimes on John Sutton. And John Sutton said, I'm not the one who's doing all this. He's the one who's doing all this. And, uh, the thing that finally convinced the Spanish was that he was a pirate is that they went through his luggage and they found, I think it was $7,000 in American banknotes. And they asked him, is this your money? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Is it illegal to have counterfeit American money in Spanish territory? And they said, not that we know of. He said, okay, that's my money. And, uh, <laughs> but then they also found 23 human scalps in his luggage. So not only were they robbing people on the Ohio, they were scalping them. And uh, so they took him, uh, they ordered he, him and his sons were sent in chains down to uh, New Orleans. And they got there just as the Louisiana Purchase was going through and the Spanish government was, set, was shutting down. And the Spanish governor said, I don't have time to deal with this. He said, send him back, he, he seems to have mainly robbed Americans, send him back up the river to Mississippi territory and let the American governor deal with it. So they had to turn around, take him all the way back up the river. 
and somebody smuggled him a gun uh, on the way back up, and they got up to near Mississippi Territory, and he and John Sutton pulled out that gun, and he killed the, Mason killed the Spanish captain, and then he and John Sutton went over the side and some other gang members. And uh, in the process of doing that, he was shot in the head, but he still managed to get away. And it caused a huge uproar on both sides of the river, uh, both on the American side and on the Spanish side. They put out wanted posters, issuing rewards for him, all this sort of thing, dead or alive, if he, if he was brought in. And so three days after he was shot in the head, uh, two of his gang members, in what only can be called an act of profound stupidity, brought his head in to uh, the authorities in Mississippi and said, we've got him. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and they were recognized by somebody who had been robbed by them and said, those are two of the pirates. And so what happened, and we know it happened because it was an international incident because it was Spanish territory. And I think it was, uh, trying to think who it was, uh, I think it was James Madison was Secretary of State at that time. And in his papers, he's actually got a description of this trial and mentions that two of Mason's gang were captured and they were hung at Greenville, Mississippi. And so we know what happened. These two guys were hung in 1803 in, uh, at uh, Greenville. And uh, the story is that they, they killed him and cut off his head. I think he was actually probably already dead from being shot in the head by, they, by the time they uh, decided they were going to cut his head off and turn him in for the reward. But his death pretty much ended organized piracy uh, on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. There were other people after him but there was nobody that operated on the scale that he operated on. So if you manage to avoid all that, and you get down the Ohio, and you get down the Mississippi, uh, and this shows that going on, this is again as a painting by George Caleb Bingham where they're down in New Orleans. And you've got two guys figuring up the value of the cargo, and they're busy selling off the cargo. Uh, and so at this point, the boat is broken up for its lumber, uh, the crew starts back, either they go back on foot, some people walked all the way back, some people rode horses, and later on they took steamboats. And at the very end of the flatboat era, they would take trains back up. But the boat itself is broken up and does not survive. And these boats all had names. You read accounts of them with all the different names of the boats. And this is a very late 1800s flatboat. Uh, I think it's got a, so a name on the side, you can actually see it. It's like the N.B. Brown. Just like when you see uh, oh, barges on the Ohio, I mean, towboats on the Ohio River or the Mississippi today, they have names. These boats had names probably of their owners. But by the end of the era, these boats are getting much, much bigger. And they're being built in commercial shipyards. And uh, what happens in this case with a big boat like this is it does come back upriver. These things are just like steamboats. They have captains on them and they'll, the boat will go all the way down to New Orleans or wherever it's going, and at the end of its voyage, they hook it to a steamboat and tow it back up. And so it'll go down another, it'll go down the next year again. And so this is a very late one that was built in 1880. So what happened? Well, what happened is the locks and dams is what did them in. Uh, with the building, these boats are hard to navigate. They found it very hard to go through locks and dams. And that pretty much ended them as far as boats that traveled all the way up, all the way down the Ohio and all the way down the Mississippi. But what you see is there was a, tra there was a historian named Reuben Thwaite, Gold, Gold Thwaite, who uh, he went down uh, in the early 1900s. He took a trip down the Ohio. And he also had a camera with him. So he's photographing boats he sees along the river. And what they're doing is these flat boats are no longer journeying, but they're still being used. And here's an example of one that he saw that has been turned into a church. And it's got a big mast in the front for a flag, some flatboats, I mean for a sail, some flatboats actually had sails. So it's still got its mast in the front for a sail, and unfortunately you can't see it too well in this photo, but it still has the big steering oar off the back. So this boat is no longer traveling but it's being turned into some sort of another building, a church. They also turned them into stores, homes. Uh, but flatboat travel continued on. Uh, on the lower Ohio, these boats become local boats, uh, a lot of peddler boats, things like that. So they're, they're continuing to be made. 
And then finally, this is a photo that was taken at the Kincaid site right across the river in the 1930s. And this is a man and his wife, and they've still got a flat bottom boat like that. And it's got these huge logs on the side that have been made like that. And she's busy, I think she is busy making a net for fishing or something here. She's got some sort of a framework here where she's working it into a net in that framework. So you still got this flatboat tradition is still continuing on into the 1930s, and this almost certainly is some sort of a locally built flatboat being built by that man. And really, it never ended. Uh, the barges that you have on the river today are the literal descendants of these boats. So really, the flatboat era never ended. Uh, it, they turned into barges, and if you ever look at the fronts of barges, they're angled just like a flatboat, except now they're being pushed by uh, you know, diesel-powered boats down the river. Uh, and a lot of people like flatboats, so people build flatboats all the time. <laughs> And uh, these are all examples of different ones that people built. Uh, you know, some are a little more accurate than others. This one is not bad down here. This one's pretty good. Uh, this one I wouldn't have wanted to be on. Uh, it's pretty overcrowded. Nobody's got a life jacket on. They've got Gilligan from Gilligan's Island over here on the side. You know, but I would not have wanted to be on that flat boat. Uh, so then we get into this, uh, the boat that John found. Uh, these boats wreck like crazy. So you sh they should be out there. Uh, part of the problem that they're not out there is that the core is constantly dredging the Ohio and the Mississippi, making it deeper. Uh, you know, so, so unless, they're, unless you're fortunate, a lot of them may have been destroyed over the years. And again, this is that one that was, that was wrecked at uh, Fort Massac in 1828. Then this is the boat that John found, and the reason we know about it is that he recognized it for what it was. So a lot of other people may have seen this wreck, but didn't know what it was. And this is the way it looked. We called it the America. Uh, all these boats had names. And we just named this one after the town. It, it's by the abandoned town of America uh, in the Ohio River in Pulaski County. And it's only exposed when the Ohio is extremely low. It's so far down the river bank. Uh, sometimes this boat is under as much as 50 feet of water, you know, and the Ohio has to drop extremely low before it comes out. And this is how it appeared when we saw it, and you can see the two big sides of it sticking out like that, and the entire inside is all filled with silt and mud. It's only the very bottom of the boat. Uh, after John found it, uh, I went to the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency and said, you know, we've got this wreck. It's a flat boat. It's the only one that anyone seems to have ever heard about. Uh, at that time, the state of Illinois actually had money. And uh, not today. <laughs> and they gave us a grant to go out and document it. And, uh, and that's what we're in the process here. And because nobody really knows how one of these boats were built, and this is the only one we ever have, uh, we concentrated on documenting the architecture and how it was put together. But this is what I mean about uh, how far this boat can be underwater. Sometimes, that's the, when the Ohio is high, it gets all the way up to there, comes out like that. So this boat sometimes is under 50 feet of water. And you can see in this case, the difference between here that's dry and here that's wet. It's only been out of water for a couple days. Uh, and when we went, did go down to document it, we had to document it in less than, I think it was 10 days. It was exposed for 10 days, and after 10 days, the water was back up over top of it again. So we had to go in there fast and, and record it. Uh, we had students come in here uh, from SIU, and again, this is, shows you all the process of that. This is after we've cleaned it out, and you can see it's the very bottom of the boat. Uh, you can see the floor. Uh, these are all big one inch thick oak planks. These are the two big sides of it. it the boat is, uh, this side is intact and it's 40 feet long. So this boat would have been 40 feet long by 12 feet wide when it was built, which is kind of characteristic of an early 1800s flat boat. And this shows, uh, again, this shows that when it's completely cleaned out, and again, they had to build this upside down, so they flipped it up, and what they've done is they've got these floor planks, and they're pegged into these side pieces called gunnels, 
and they're pegged into these two long stringers and then cross stringers like that. And so that's how they're holding that boat together. And this is a map of it. And it shows how big it originally would have been. So only really only about half of it is out there. And then on the side, when we documented it, we found there was a ledge that had all these little holes in it. And what these are, they are the stanchions for the sides of the boat that the planks, the side of the boat is going to be nailed to, the wooden planks. And that, this, again, is going back to the model of a, of a flat boat that's in the uh, SIU Museum. So all we got was this, of this boat, that very bottom. And what happened to the upper part? Well, actually, I'm saying here it's 12 feet by 45 feet long. What happened to the upper part of it? Uh, probably a couple different things could have happened. Uh, uh, sawn lumber would have been at a premium on the frontier. So some settlers who found this boat abandoned uh, probably would have dismantled it right away. Uh, and, you know, they get down to the bottom, and, you know, they can't get the bottom out of the mud, but they could have very quickly dismantled that top part. Uh, the other thing that could have happened is that the Ohio could have risen very suddenly and swept off the top part of the boat and only left the bottom down here. And this is how they're holding it together, again. Uh, and the sort of logs they're using, these things on the side are all hand-hewn. They've got big ax marks on them. These are the oak boards on the bottom. All these oak boards, these are just real roughly cut logs running this way and that way. But there are wooden pegs that are holding every one of these boards is pegged into this one, and every one is pegged into this one. And that's how they're holding it to bottom together. There's not an iron nail in the, single bo in the entire boat. It's all wooden pegs. Just like if you see some old barns, you see really old barns, they're all put together with wooden pegs. And that's, a, that's another indication that this is an old boat, that it didn't have any iron in it. But this is what I'm talking about with these stanchions. These stanchions have to go up, and the side planks have to be pegged into those. And this is what's going on here. These are the peg holes for the stanchions. If you look at them, uh, they're not round. This one's a lot smaller, and they get bigger, and they get bigger, and they get bigger. And what that is is it's water action. Uh, this part has been sticking out for a long time, and the water action has eroded those little peg holes into these big, long elliptical holes. But there once were these stanchions went up to hold the upper side in place. And these are some of the things that there are additional artifacts that John got off. Of. Well, that, these actually are the ones that some of these are the ones that John found on it. These down here also. This is a caulking mallet, like I was talking about earlier, which you're supposed to take uh, as part of your, uh, uh, just part of the cruise supplies. And, and every flatboat is supposed to have one of these things. These are some additional things we found in the wreck. They're typical of the period, a couple buttons, some redware containers. This actually is the handle of a pocket knife that was in there. And then a... <coughs> Uh, top to a wine bottle. But this gave us some idea of how old this wreck was. Uh, these three pewter spoons that John got off, found on the boat, uh, they had the hallmark of a silversmith in England who was only in operation, I think, from 1801 to 1811. And what that let us know was that this boat had to have been built after 1801 because it had those silver, those pewter spoons on board it. And you know, so probably it's some, a boat that's being built in, our guess is in the 1830s. And by that time, these are old items. And they're just being carried on board the boat as part of the cruise uh, supplies. Uh, so why'd the boat wreck? Uh, well, you know, it could have wrecked for any number of reasons. Uh, it's unlikely that it was attacked by pirates. It's unlikely it was attacked by Indians. There's a ton of natural reasons why a boat like that could wreck. Uh, interesting thing about it is the artifacts that were on the wreck uh, weren't the cargo. They were like the personal items that belonged to the crew and tools that they would have needed if they got into trouble. Uh, no cargo at all, no trace of the boat's cargo, which suggests that it was salvaged after it wrecked. And it's kind of just like today, but at that time, uh, the rule was, if you walked away from one of these boats, it was fair game for the next person who came down the river. So they would leave guys. They would get a flatboat that would be stranded like these are up here. And 
you know, if the Ohio had dropped real low and they got stranded on a sandbar, sometimes they'd be sitting there for like a month or six weeks waiting for the river to rise so they could go back again. If they left, the next person who came down the river could claim their cargo. Uh, so they did leave crews behind to guard these things. Ah, so this boat, after it sank, somebody probably came along and salvaged it and removed the cargo. And all you're getting, going back to these things, they're things that were probably lying in the bottom of the boat. They either were not worth salvaging or they couldn't be found because if the boat is partially underwater, they couldn't find these things, so they left them behind. <clears throat> so this is an example of what happens when I was just talking about. This is a steamboat where they had to do the same thing. Uh, again, it's a, a painting by George Calabingham, but they had to do the same thing with flatboats. These guys, they've unloaded the cargo, and these guys have to sit there with the cargo to guard it until somebody can arrange to come pick up the cargo. And if you did a flatboat, you wrecked a flatboat, you had to do the same sort of thing. Uh, so this boat most likely wrecked from natural causes and was salvaged. Uh, one reason it could have sunk was poor construction. Uh, the boats that were built in commercial shipyards on the Ohio River were notorious for being badly built. Uh, a lot of it had to do uh, with the fact that these uh, shipyards up at Pittsburgh built these uh, boats. These are one-way boats. Uh, so by the time somebody who bought one of these boats realizes it's leaking constantly at the mouth of the Ohio River, they're not coming back up the river to complain. And uh, Zadok Kramer again, who wrote the guides. This is in 1803, and everybody talks about federal regulation today. He's urging that federal inspectors be stationed in the Ohio Rip River shipyards to stop the criminal activities of the boat builders. So there are thousands of boats probably being built that are in bad shape and are not good boats if you're not building it yourself. And this shows a guy doing this. Pay, this is a diff not a flatboat, but a different type of ship. And this is a uh, shipwright. And he's drilled holes and he's putting in the wooden pegs to hold the planks to that stanchion. And this is what made us think that this boat sank from natural causes. Uh, when we cleaned it out, we noticed that there was a difference in preservation between this corner and this corner. This is the back of the boat. That would be the uh, left side. That's the right side. And the left side was perfectly intact. And you've got to figure everything being equal, every part of this boat ought to be equally preserved because every, every part of it is being affected the same way. But when we looked at this joint over here, it was all rotted. And then when we looked at it closer, and you can't really tell it here, but the two peg holes made to hold this corner together do not connect. So it had been whoever put this corner together made a bad joint, and this corner was not tightly sealed like this one over here. And so this thing was probably leaking from the beginning. And if you bought it in a shipyard in Pittsburgh, you wouldn't have known it because it would have had a stanchion sitting right above it. So they hid that bad joint on the thing. So what I think happened is that whoever was traveling in this boat, it may have been leaking constantly. When they finally get to the lower Ohio, it just gives way. This bad joint finally gives out. And either they're able to get the boat to shore or they, they go down partially in the river because of that bad joint. So they're sinking from natural causes. Uh, what can you do with it? Uh, in 2002, we had various people who were interested in it, uh, but you kind of got into local politics and state politics. And uh, this was in Pulaski County. And we talked about maybe removing it and putting it in Cairo and Alexander County because they have a customs house in Alexander County that's big enough to display this. The people in Pulaski County said, no, if it goes anywhere, it's going to Pulaski County. So they didn't want it removed. Uh, the state of Kentucky actually offered, or, or I'll, I'll put it this way, somebody with connections in Kentucky actually offered, said he could raise the money to have this money this removed from the bank and preserved and displayed at the River Museum in Paducah. And the state of Illinois said, no, it's, <laughs> it's in Illinois. And uh, so the state of Illinois would not let it go across the Ohio River. And the result is that it's still out there. And this is what we had to do in 2002. We tarped it up and covered it with gravel to hold it in place, tarped it and covered it with that. Uh, another problem with this boat 
is that uh, it has to be conserved. If you take a piece of wood out of the river that's been in there for 200 years, uh, it's water saturated. And if you don't preserve it, uh, what it'll do, it'll start to rot t and twist out of shape. <clears throat> so the process of preserving it takes about five years, and it's an expensive process. There was no money for that. And finally, the other part of the problem is this wreck is 45 feet long by 12 feet wide, and very few museums want to dedicate a big room to display one thing forever. And so that's another problem. You, you're going to need an awful big place to display this. And finally, it was damaged in 2007 again. We went back out there at that time, found the river had come back up. It had taken the one side of the boat, completely flipped it out of place, flipped it crosswise across the wreck. We got an emergency grant from the Illinois Landmarks Preservation Council. Uh, we went out there with a backhoe, and we dug a trench next to it, and we were actually able to pick up that side piece in one piece and bury it in the trench, and we nailed it to a, we tied it to a marker on the riverbank, which is still there. I saw it a couple months ago out there. Uh, so what is the future for this thing? Uh, I don't know. I did go out and see it about two or three months ago. It's still there, surprisingly. A little bit more of the front of it may be gone, but most of the back of it is still there, and it's still covered up. Uh, and it's, it's a very important thing. It's the only one of these ever found. Uh, it's an important link to the old early history of the Lower Ohio River Valley. It is not stable. Uh, as that slide I just showed you indicated where that gunnel, this piece here, is a piece that got flipped over by the river and was laying across the boat. So it needs to be removed from the bank uh, and displayed. And uh, unfortunately, there's no funds to do that at the moment. And this is a photo I like to use to embarrass my daughter, who's 21. <laughs> That's her saluting in the river. And then finally, one last slide. This is, uh, these are nuns who are going down the river. I actually talked to the guy who built this. And uh, these nuns were reenacting uh, the immigration of their order to Indiana. And they traveled down the river by flatboat to Indiana. So they were reenacting like the 150th anniversary of their order's trip down the river. So you've got nuns on the river. So, all right. Well, thank you. If you have any questions. Yeah. Mark, I just wanted to say, have you been down to Natchez? Anyway, we went to Natchez one time, and below the bluff, that's kind of the yeah. upper part of town, there's a there's a restaurant there, and it, the, all the paneling in there, it says it's boards off a of flatboat. Well, they may say that, but is it? <laughs> well, that's where they were taking them apart. Natchez yeah, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. It's you're saying, it's our, I, 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 get, I get what you're saying, that it actually was... Being they were being dismantled, man. Yeah, that's, oh, that would that be. Was the end of the, uh, no, I've not been in that. Yeah. Someone told me about that, so we were there. We were, <laughs> oh, that'd be pretty cool. I haven't seen that. But that would—that's what happened to them. They probably dismantled for building material. Yeah. I thought the uh, Ohio River belonged to Kentucky. Uh, there is a uh, a question about that. Kentucky says it belongs to Kentucky. And Kentucky says this boat is so far down the riverbank that it belongs to Kentucky. Uh, the state of Illinois disputes that. The Corps of Engineers dispute that. The Corps of Engineers say, no, it's in Illinois. And, uh, and so we got into that. That's another problem with it is who does own this boat? Who owns it? Illinois, Kentucky, you know. Uh, I think it's something that you could resolve pretty easily. But at the time, nobody was willing to resolve it. You know? But yeah, no, we did go through that. The state of Kentucky actually made us get a, not only did we have to get a permit from Illinois, and this is a lesson to if you find something on the riverbank and you think, uh, it, you know, like a treasure hunter, it doesn't belong to anybody. Everything belongs to somebody. You know? And uh, what we got involved in, we had to get three different permits. We had to get a permit from the state of Illinois to do that to make the state of Kentucky happy. We had to get a permit from the state of Kentucky to investigate it. And the Corps of Engineers, we had to get a permit from them because we were disturbing the riverbank. You know, so, you know, everything belongs <laughs> to somebody. Some agency's got control over it. 
Yes. Uh, talking about the pirates, uh, what about Big Heart and Little Heart? Uh, they were supposed to be part of Mason's gang, but there's nothing that ever ties them. There's no document that ties them to him. Uh, they actually started most of their criminal activities after he was driven out of Henderson, Kentucky. And it may be that they were part of his gang at one time, but there was an early historian uh, named Lyman Draper, and he, uh, he traveled all through the Midwest for like 30 years, and he interviewed them, all the early settlers. And, he, and the only reason we know so much about like the Indian Wars in Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois and Ohio is because Lyman Draper ran down, he ran down the Indians too, and interviewed them. And he, ran, he was very interested in the Harps, and he was very interested in Mason. And he could never tie them together. And he interviewed, like, Mason, one of the Harps' wives. And he could not tie them together. And he presents them as separate stories. And he would have loved to have gotten them together. But he couldn't find any document that, that connected the two of them. The Harps are very real, and they're as bad as Mason. Uh, there's no indication that they ever rob boats on the Ohio and the Mississippi River, although, you know, it's possible they were part of his gang, but, you know, uh, it, it's interesting that they start, the, the Harps start uh, killing people in 1797, the same year he's chased out of Henderson, Kentucky. So it almost seems like there's some sort of connection where all of a sudden the Harps are on their own and doing things. Like if Mason was a very organized, he very organized criminal. It's almost like that these two have been let loose on their own and then they start on their rampage through Kentucky. But again, there's no document that ties them to him. Doesn't mean they weren't part of his gang, but there's nothing there. 